And now introducing Thomas Zimmerman, Director of Programs for the Pacific Council. Good morning or afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're located. Uh, thank you so much for dialing in today. Um, I'm very excited to lead a conversation on uh, challenges to US election security. And we're at a moment where we're 40 days out from election day and ballots are already being cast in a number of states. So this is quite far from a hypothetical uh, conversation that we're having. It is very immediate and it has the potential to directly impact the lives of, of every single person who is listening in here today. So we wanna make this a bit more of a conversation. Um, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A box where you can submit uh, questions at any point. Um, I'll sort of weave them into the conversation. We'll have some time at the end that's dedicated specifically to answering the questions that you all pose. But don't feel like you need to wait. If something comes up and is relevant, I can uh, address it right there at the moment. So first of all, I'm Thomas Zimmerman. I'm the Director of Programs here at the Pacific Council on International Policy. And we are very excited to have David Brody, who's joining us today, who is counsel and Senior Fellow for Privacy and Technology at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. David leads the Digital Justice Initiative at the committee and is the lead expert on uh, sort of the intersection of privacy, free speech, hate groups, racial discrimination, and government surveillance. Um, joining us as well, we have Camille Francois, who is the Chief Innovation Officer at Graphica, where she leads the company's work to detect and mitigate misinformation and media manipulation. She previously was the principal researcher at Google's Jigsaw uh, Innovation Unit and spearheaded the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence's report on Russian electoral interference. Um, a number of you got a, a note earlier on that uh, Kristen Clark um, was going to be joining. She's not able to join today, uh, but we are very excited for the conversation we're about to have. So with that, I kind of wanted to dive right in. David, um, there's been a, a lot of conversation that we will be going to to talk about the way that uh, you know various international actors are playing a role in manipulating uh, the potential outcome of the election or trying to sow disinformation in this election. Uh, but I think it's it's useful to look at home first and talk about ways that domestic actors are actually primary players in this whole situation. Uh, could you talk a bit about what you're seeing in that space right now? Sure, and, and, and thank you for having me. So I think one way to think about this is what we saw in 2016 and to a lesser extent in 2018 was sort of a, a rough draft or prototype for how to, to interfere in elections. And things have gotten a lot more sophisticated since then, both in the sense that it's no longer uh, just or primarily foreign actors, but we now have a lot of domestic disinformation actions happening. Uh, and, and some of this is coordinated, some of it is organic, some of it is just provocateurs trying to get attention or be trolls. Um, you know, so a, a lot of what we're seeing is a lot of misinformation about how to vote, when to vote, where to vote, uh, voting by mail, uh, voter ID requirements, uh, a lot of misinformation about the prevalence of, of voter fraud. And, and to be clear, voter fraud is extremely rare. Uh, it, it almost never happens. And, and when it does, it ha almost never has any impact on an election. But if, if you were following some of the, the media narratives and the disinformation that we're seeing on social media, you would think that, that voter fraud is rampant. Um, in terms of, of the actors that are involved in these types of campaigns, uh, it, it, it's everything from uh, actual political operatives domestically to uh, media personalities to just rank and file people sharing things that they shouldn't share. Uh, and, and one of the fundamental problems here that, that leads to this sort of environment where disinformation can go rampant is the, the structure and business models of the platforms themselves. They're built for engagement, which means they're designed to uh, spread the content that is most likely 
to get users to continue to engage with the platforms because that keeps the users eyeballs on the platforms and that means that the users will see more ads and the platform makes more money. Uh, but these engagement algorithms do not necessarily account for the truthfulness of the information that they're sharing. Uh, and one of the things that we have learned is that false information can be extremely engaging. So I understand obviously that you have occasions in which people share misinformation, um, things that they, as you said, things that they shouldn't be sharing. Um, domestically, who's generating this stuff? We'll, we'll talk about sort of international producers, but where is this coming from? Uh, and what's the point of entry here? I, I don't think that there's a centralized source. It's highly decentralized. Um, and sometimes you see disinformation coming from specific political campaigns and including sometimes presidential campaigns. Uh, and, and you see it from political shops. Uh, but a lot of it is more organic. It's uh, people who have an agenda or interest in creating or sharing political information uh, that may not have any sort of organizational tie to an, a, some sort of coordinated campaign. Uh, but it, so there, there's a lot of different points of entry and I, it's not all coordinated. Um, so one sort of follow-up question on that. You know, there's been, you said that, you know, on occasion political campaigns, that the conversation in the press has been that this is disproportionately coming from a specific presidential campaign. Um, is that an accurate depiction or is this one of those things where everybody's engaging in it? Um, or are there really particular actors, namely the Trump campaign that has been uh, particularly active in this space? Uh, yeah, no, it's, th this is not a, this is not really a both sides issue. Uh, this is, this is the, the Trump campaign and um, folks affiliated with it are uh, engaging in this activity in a, a way that the, the Biden campaign and, and Democratic actors are not. Uh, we, we've repeatedly see, seen the president spreading false information about voting by mail, about voter fraud, about uh, the legitimacy of the election and, and whether or not an election might be rigged. Uh, and, and even yesterday, uh, refusing to answer as to whether he would uh, peacefully transfer power if he lost the election. Um, this is a, a coordinated effort by the president's campaign to uh, cast doubt and sling mud on the election outcome so that if he loses the election, he can claim that it was rigged and he, he didn't just lose because he's unpopular. So uh, Camille, on, in a similar both sides vein, uh, but looking at this in sort of a geopolitical context, there's been a, a lot of talk in the last couple months about how in addition to the Russians that famously uh, played a, a role in the 2016 cycle, um, that, that the Chinese and the Iranians are similarly undertaking influence operations in the United States. We've heard this from, from Microsoft, from the US government. Um, and so you have one campaign uh, or, or one party that's sort of ringing bells about a repeat of 2016. And then you have another that is saying, you know, no, Be Beijing's the real problem this time. Uh, and I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about, you've obviously done a lot of work on Russian interference. Uh, what are the different ways these states are engaging and yeah. what should people make of all this? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, let me give you a little bit of an in the weeds answer. What really happened in 2016 is when the Russian interference um, unfolds and suddenly gets visibility, this becomes something that honestly Silicon Valley was not prepared for, Washington wasn't prepared for, and a whole variety of people are just caught flat-footed and discover the idea of foreign interference using social media for the first time. And so around 2017, you start having a recognition that foreign actors do use social media, do create fake websites, fake activists, fake personas, uh, fake channels on a whole bunch of platforms to influence political conversation. Russia is top of mind, of course, at that moment. 
But this is also the beginning of a three-year process for the entire field to catch up with how many people had been doing this for a very long time. And so, you know, we sort of like, as a field, people who work on disinformation research, start this process of realizing, oh, it isn't just Russia, and it isn't just 2016. This had been going on for a long time. The first time the Russian IRA started targeting the US domestic audiences is 2014. And of course, they've continued to do that throughout 2020. People also realized like, wow, Iran had also been doing that since 2013. And we sort of have to unravel and do the archeology span of everything that was missed. We realized China had been doing that in the context of its near abroad very focused on Taiwan, very focused on Hong Kong, but a whole lot of other operations sort of, sort of appearing as the field sort of realizes and catches up with this problem. Um, all the platforms create terms of services that start to address this problem that wasn't the case before. People start getting specialized and uncovering these types of operation. And so we start finding that Saudi Arabia has also done this. We start finding that multiple for hire actors are also doing this on behalf of governments, but also on behalf of other clients. And so this is sort of like general three years of catching up that leads us to today, where we have a much more complete picture that this type of activity does happen on a fairly regular basis. Multiple actors, both domestic and foreign, both private and state sponsored, do engage in disinformation that's aimed to manipulate um, domestic audiences. And uh, this is indeed something that's quite, um, that's quite prevalent around us. Now, I will say something that I think is new now and better is we, from a pendulum swing perspective, went from, oh, we didn't know this happened, to, wow, this is really bad and it's a major concern to now having a little bit more of a measured and dispassionate assessment that yes, there are a lot of fake accounts. Some of them are manned by foreign actors on social media, but they're not going to destroy democracy. And it's not the only problem that we're facing. So that's sort of like a very fast forward picture of three years of catching up with, um, with that, that thread. So would you say then that like, to, to what degree are these accounts and these efforts effective? Like, how, how effective, um, there's obviously been a, a lot of in, uh, emphasis and focus on the, the Russian effort in 2016, but how effective are these tools at achieving the objectives of the actors who are trying to use them? It's a great question because it really depends on campaigns and they're often, you know, less effective than what we give them credit for. Um, I have seen entire campaigns that were completely ineffective at achieving any form of meaningful viral traction. There is a campaign that is originating in China, which my team has discovered called Spamouflage Dragon. We worked with all the tech platforms on multiple occasions to make sure that they could deactivate those accounts. And it's a lot of accounts producing a lot of content. But when you look at it in the details, Nobody's watching their videos. All the comments are fake accounts commenting on fake accounts, commenting on fake accounts. So no real people is exposed to this content. And so it's really important to do this sort of like this passionate assessment of impact because if you only look at the numbers, you're like, wow, enormous number of accounts, enormous number of videos, enormous number of comments. But when you look at the impact, you're like, oh, it's completely self-referential. No real people has been exposed to any of this activity. Similarly, we've seen, uh, so I'm saying, sorry, on the opposite side of this coin, we've seen operations that have only one page, but their impact on real life can be much more troublesome because, for instance, they've been talking to real people on the ground and encouraging people to go to a rally or to come to a protest. So it's very difficult to sort of measure the true impact of an information operation for many reasons, but it's really important to sort of like look at it systematically and, um, and not overestimate the impact that they can have. First of all, that's a, a fantastic name for a campaign. Uh, but I, I'm curious, 
are there, you, you've mentioned campaign to campaign, it differs. Um, who is doing it very well and who is not, right? You know, I, the Saudis are involved, the, the North Koreans are involved. Um, are the scale of, say, the, the China's influence operations and the Russian influence operations roughly synonymous, or is there really a, a shift in terms of sophistication? Yeah, it's a great question because a lot of this has to do with how early these operations are caught. And so if you consider, for instance, the Internet Research Agency and the operation that targeted the U.S. election in 2016, a little bit before and a little bit after, a lot of the damage was done because those accounts had lived online for three, two, um, even sometimes four years, right? And so for all these times, they had managed to accumulate an audience and to engage people with their content. And so when it was time to sort of, um, you know, create the impact that they were looking for, they already had this audience that was captive and that they could reach easily. And here, like a lot of the efficiency was because they had time to build an audience. We've seen since a lot of Russian operations that could have ended up being as efficient, but that got detected earlier. And therefore, they kind of got detected at the stage where it didn't really matter. So I'll give you a specific example. Um, a few months ago, working with two professors at Clemson University, working with the CNN investigations team and with Facebook and Twitter, we investigated an operation linked to the IRA taking place quite recently in which they were hiring activists based in Ghana to create social media accounts and target the black community in the US. And what they were doing is creating a lot of sort of feel good posts and feel good content to build this audience. They were using, for instance, the hashtag Black History Month a lot. And they were using it not just in February, sort of like all year round. This could have resulted in a fairly concerning operation. But because it got detected early and because it got taken down early, at the time where action was taken, it still remains a handful of Instagram accounts with a handful of posts that did not gather a lot of engagement. So a lot of the impact isn't just the sophistication of the techniques, but it really has a lot to do when, with when can we catch the campaign and at what stage of it. Hmm. Well, so uh, related to that question, um, and I'm gonna pose this to both of you, uh, but before I do that, I wanted to remind everyone who joined late, uh, if you want to submit a question and get involved in the conversation, throw something in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and, and we'll bring it in. Um, if a lot of this comes down to how early these things are detected and how early they are acted upon, I imagine that applies to both foreign interference campaigns and also just general domestic disinformation. Um, what are the the platforms doing, Facebook and Twitter, um, or what are they not doing that they should be doing? Uh, what could they be doing to um, play a, a more constructive role in confronting this um, that we would like to sort of see to change this for future cycles? Um, and, and David, I'll, I'll start with you on that. Sure, so I think uh, when we think about the social media platforms, we have to think about both their policies and how they execute those policies. Uh, and those two things do not always align. So on the policy side, uh, one of the challenges here is that, and, and the, the platforms have evolved a little bit, Twitter in particular is getting somewhat better, um, but the, the platforms have, have tended to adopt uh, what what's called like the view from nowhere, this sort of journalistic idea of we are neutral arbiters, we're going to treat everyone and all points of view equally as if everything has has some sort of legitimate merit. And we're we don't want to be the arbiters of what's true and not true. And we, we don't want to take down false content if a politician says it, even if that can result in harm because we think politicians should get to say whatever they want to say. Uh, and, and so you, you end up with a system that sort of legitimizes bad actors because you have 
bad actors with very large followings who, you know, might be so-called blue check marked on Twitter or, or whatever, um, who, because their accounts don't get disciplined when they spread false information, or if they just get a, a tiny little disclaimer label that says, you know, click here for, at, for voting information, but doesn't actually tell you that what that, that user just posted is actually false. It, it legitimizes what those actors are saying. Um, so, you know, on the policy level, the, the platforms have more to do. Um, they, they, when this information is shared and detected, they, um, for, you know, there's a range of responses. Some information can just be taken down. Some information can be uh, labeled with a disclaimer and hidden behind an interstitial, you know, sort of like a, you know, there's something bad here, but if you really want to see it, you can click and see it. Uh, and, and, and some information should be restricted from being shared or commented on uh, and, and should, in some cases, be algorithmically downranked. There's a range of options for the platforms here, but they have consistently been slow to adapt and use additional tools in their toolkit uh, out of fear of being uh, blasted primarily from the, the conservative side of the aisle for uh, moderating their platforms. Um, and, and so, you know, this has led to situations like back in, uh, the, in, in May or June when, you know, President Trump posted on Facebook with regard to the George Floyd protests, uh, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. This, was, this, is, a, this is a racist statement linked to uh, the 1960s law enforcement officials who were referring to shooting civil rights protesters. Um, and, and it was a statement that was used by George Wallace. Uh, Facebook left it up. They didn't put any content, the context around it, even though that statement on its face violates Facebook's rules about inciting violence. Uh, and, and, you know, so there, there's, uh, on the one hand, the platforms need to have clear and strong policies about how they are going to more aggressively respond to this disinformation. And on and the other part of it, they need to actually follow through with enforcement in a non-arbitrary and systematic way. So related to that, we actually have a question from uh, Seth's daughter who um, pointed out the fact that a, a large um, reason why this has become such a problem is the sort of self-feeding mechanisms of having information that both comes from government actors that is misinformation, um, information that comes from uh, foreign actors that then gets repeated by domestic actors, therefore giving it credibility, and then a set of, you know, algorithms that essentially just feed self-reinforcing information to individuals, therefore giving it the sheen of truth. Um, could you talk a bit about how those algorithms work and why they are particularly toxic? Sure. Uh, so, yeah, as, as I was sort of saying before, the platforms are built to maximize engagement. When you go on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube or whatever, the content that you're shown, especially the content that pops up at the top of your feed, is not just the most recent thing that happened on the platform or the most popular thing that happened on the platform. It is individualized to you based on what the platform thinks you are most likely to be interested in and engage with. Uh, and so what that means is uh, whatever it is that you have liked before, you're going to get more of it. And so you, you get these sort of feedback loops. Uh, if you like a certain type of political content, you're going to get more of that political content. Uh, and in some cases, this can result in some really harmful spirals. So we, we've seen how, um, for example, if someone likes a Confederate group on Facebook, Facebook will promote to that user additional Confederate groups they might want to join. Uh, and, and, you know, it's the algorithm doing that. 
so when a, a user gets sort of, uh, when, when disinformation gets its foot in the door with the user and the user sort of, you know, engages with it to an extent, if that information uh, is something that is likely to drive further engagement, the, the platforms will amplify and, and reinforce it with more content of a similar nature. So Camille, related to the, the earlier question, um, from your perspective, what should the, the platforms be doing? Um, what are they doing? You've obviously spent time um, in that world uh, and so know what it's like to be on the back end of a tech company trying to navigate this space. Um, but also, what is the government doing to um, adapt to this? There's been a, a lot of talk about the idea that they are not doing enough. That's been a, a pretty consistent message of, of this campaign. Um, but it would be helpful to get a sense of what action is being taken. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I will say, I think that sometimes we tend to sort of put a lot of things on the bucket of disinformation. And we tend to put a lot of things that really just do not belong together. So at the end of the day, you know, your uncle saying things that you think are stupid on Facebook has nothing in common with a sophisticated information operation designed to suppress vote run by Russian military. And so I think the first thing that really matters here is while there's an overarching concern about how people engage with social media, the rise of polarization, people's understanding of algorithmic eco chambers, there are still at the end of the day problems that are radically different and should be addressed sort of differently. So I'll talk about the information operations side. So what do we do about the Russians? What do we do about the Chinese campaigns? And the progress that's been made there. And that being said, I want to acknowledge that there's still progress to be made sort of all across the board from how we address IO to how we address other parts of the disinformation and polarization um, question. On information operation, what we see today that's very different from 2016 is all these platforms have created sort of dedicated violations that cover this. I know it sounds a bit odd, but in reality, last time around in 2016, there really wasn't any sort of actual rules that would prevent this type of operations on most of the platforms. So that's the first thing. They have specific rules on the type of um, disinformation campaigns that uh, they're looking for and taking down their platform and they have empowered uh, their internal teams to go and detect those. The thing that's happened that's also quite interesting is we've created a standard of transparency for what happens when they do find these types of operations. Um, not all platforms are doing as well as uh, the other on these standards of transparency. And I think that's another thing we should watch out for. We tend to say the platforms was sort of like a generous package, but in reality, you have very different uh, approaches to this problem, very different sort of appetites for transparency uh, from one platform to another. But in general, we've seen more transparency from the platforms who, when they detect an operation, now tend to inform the public about it. That helps uh, people to understand like, okay, when we say there was a Chinese operation targeting uh, you know, this audience, what does it actually mean? What did it look like? What did the data look like? And that sort of helps inform the debate. I think there should be more of that, but I welcome that we're now in this position, which again, wasn't at all the case a few years back. On the government side, I do think that there is a need for regulation in this area. And that's the first obvious answer. I think all experts have a bit of nervousness when we talk about government regulations around internet content because we have seen so many bad regulatory proposals, so many proposals that go against a series of fundamental rights from freedom of expression to privacy. And so I think we're at the point where we've seen so many bad regulatory proposals, but yet we agree that there should be 
a good way forward where there is more regulation to encourage at least transparency and accountability in the way the platforms encourage that. And then just for the sake of completeness, to look back on those questions of information operations, the Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians, what are governments doing? We see something now that again was not in place on the last election cycle, which is they are government entities who have taken it upon themselves to detect those operations and alert the platform of those operations. It has happened twice uh, in the, uh, I, I think it has just happened twice <laughs> since the government started doing this. In 2018, during the midterms, uh, US law enforcement detected a Russian attempt to interfere with the midterms and told the platforms about it so that they could investigate and take action. And it has happened again a few weeks ago where um, US law enforcement have detected another Russian attempt to manipulate US audiences and have told the platforms about it so that they can detect it, see what it looks like on their services and take action. That too is something that, that is new and that I think is welcome. So related to that, obviously this is one of the most sensitively political uh, topics that these agencies have to engage in around elections, right? Because the moment you put out one of those statements, it is guaranteed to end up in an opponent's attack ad. Um, and so I'm sure that there's a high degree of, um, of sensitivity and conversation that, that goes into deciding how these statements are framed, um, when they're released, all that. Um, could you talk a bit about um, what, to the degree you know, what that conversation looks like? Like how, how does a, uh, at what level does the interference have to be taking place for um, a government agency to come out and say, this is a problem, we're alerting the public? That's a good question. I think that in reality, all these attempts have to be detected and transparently shared. And if you put the bar at all the attempts that are detected are transparently shared, that also helps people know that if nothing has been shared, then everything is fine. And I think that's important because a big risk of disinformation is overhyping the threat that leads to a complete lack of trust in the entire system. And so if people go around their lives online discussing US politics, discussing the election, always wondering if the people talking to them is a Russian troll, then in many ways we've achieved ourselves what the enemies who are trying to divide us into chaos were trying to do. And so in, in my assessment, I think we should put the bar very low and agree that any attempt to interfere, any disinformation campaign, should be documented and transparently published because again it helps create the expectation that that means that the rest is a likely organic grassroots normal conversation and that we still live in an information environment that we should be able to trust so uh and i'll pose this to to david we got a question from uh, nancy rosenblum uh, asking about ads specifically she's talking about ads on on television fact checking these claims that are inaccurate but i sort of want to broaden that out you, you see a lot of these sort of fact check statements uh videos as well as the the new tags that twitter and, and facebook are applying uh, i realize i just grouped all the platforms again just like we talked about uh but the, the sort of the the little flags that facebook and twitter are putting on their posts saying you know, this is not accurate, voting is safe, et cetera, and so forth. Um, do you all have research as to how effective that is? You know, is flagging that content actually changing the conversation or is it, uh, you know, just more superficial? Right, so it, it entirely depends on the execution, right? So, so we've seen two fairly different ways of doing this between Facebook and Twitter. Uh, and, and it's also worth noting, we, we've seen very little to no action from Google and YouTube. Um, on Facebook, they decided to put the same sort of innocuous get voting information here label on all 
political election related statements from from politicians and and similar high profile individuals the effect of that is the user ignores it right if everything is labeled and disclaimed then nothing is labeled and disclaimed because it becomes part of the background noise and it, it if you put the same label on perfectly innocuous truthful you know benign statements as you put on harmful statements that violate the platform's policies then the user's not being informed that the rules have been broken uh on on twitter they, they're doing it a bit more aggressively and, and and better it's still not perfect uh but they're putting labels that that will say things like, you know, on a deceptive vote by mail statement from the president, it'll say, you know, voting by mail is safe, click here to get more information about why voting by mail is safe, something, something, something. Uh, there's still the issue that, uh, first off, if, if content is violating the platform's rules, it should be hidden behind some sort of interstitial screen so that the user doesn't see it before they know that it violates the rules. Uh, and, and second, the, the disclaimer language needs to clearly state something to the effect of this post violates our rules about X, Y, Z, but we're leaving it up because we think it has some, some newsworthiness for the user to know what their politicians are saying, something to that effect. Um, the, the other thing I'd sort of say about uh, on the advertising side of things is uh, in, this is where privacy and transparency uh, legislation or regulation comes into play uh, in a way that could be really helpful. So almost all of the major platforms have some form of advertising library for political ads. There's huge discrepancies from one platform to another as to how thorough they are, and none of them are actually all that great. Um, for example, Google's ad transparency, political ad transparency library only includes political ads that specifically name a candidate or an election or a, a elected official. If you have a more generic political ad that doesn't specifically name someone like that, even if it's from a political party, it doesn't go into the library. And you know, those of us on the outside who are trying to follow these issues don't even know it exists. Um, Facebook's political ad library is better. It has, it's a, it has a lot more ads in it. Uh, it. It has pretty much everything that could count as like a political ad or an issue ad goes into the ad library. But the problem there is uh, they're not giving adequate transparency about who is being targeted with the ads and who is receiving the ads, right? If we want to know if specific demographic groups like, say, Black voters in Cleveland or uh, Cuban voters in Miami are being targeted with misleading messages or, or other types of, of ads in a, in a deceptive way, we need to know, you know, not just the very generic age, gender, and state that the ad was targeted to, we, sh we should be able to see the targeting criteria that the advertiser used to the extent that that criteria is not proprietary information. Uh, and similarly, the platforms will give back to the advertiser some information about how their ad was delivered and who saw the ad. To the extent that that information does not infringe on individual privacy, th those sorts of aggregate demographics are also things that should be disclosed so that we know when things are having disparate impacts. Um, and then the, the other point I'll just make briefly on this is you know, to the question of what can the government do? What are the proposed solutions? Uh, you don't have to necessarily regulate speech directly, right? A lot of this comes down to the architecture and the business models of some of these platforms. And that is where it's really important for us to get comprehensive federal privacy legislation and data protection legislation that uh, has rules and regulations about 
transparency and controls and limits on how personal data is used and how ads are targeted to ensure that ads and other content is not delivered in a discriminatory fashion uh, and, and to you know, ensure that algorithms uh, get audited for discriminatory biases and provide enforcement and redress for people whose rights are violated. If you can get that kind of regime in place, because right now the internet's sort of a wild west when it comes to privacy legislation in the US. If you can get some regime like that in place, you can start to create the economic incentives for the platforms to build more responsible structures. And you don't need to have a, a federal agency saying like this speech is good, this speech is bad, because Besides the fact that the First Amendment won't allow that, that's not something we want the government doing. Um, you actually ended up perfectly answering our next question from Phil Kersner. So thank you for just being able to see that coming down the tracks. Um, I wanted to, as we kind of get close to the end here, uh, be a little bit forward looking. I, the FBI just put out a warning about potential disinformation around uh, election results, particularly in the case of um, a contested election. So as people who engage in social media um, are the, the targets of all of this information, um, what should people be doing as individuals uh, to make sure not only that they are getting good information, but that they are sharing accurate information? Uh, and one question we got uh, relates to beyond just flagging something is incorrect through the platforms, um, are there ways that people can hold these platforms accountable? Um, so uh, Camille, I'll start with you on that. Uh, what should people be looking for? Um, and potentially, how will this look different than it did the last election cycle? Yeah, and I want to start with a um, sort of positive, optimistic observation. Um, as someone who studies information operation all day, every day. I think often the perception is that people are very gullible and easy to manipulate. When in reality, in most information operations that we study, what's fascinating to see is you see fake accounts that are trying to push out a narrative. And more often than not, I see real people pushing back. And I see this increasingly. Um, we uncovered a very large Russian information operation called secondary infection. Secondary infection was doing forged documents and was sort of posting it on Reddit and on multiple forums. And when they did that, the users in this forum would say, what is this? This looks like a forged document. This is sloppy. Who's this account? Also, it was created 10 minutes ago. Is this a troll? And I think that like it's important to highlight that in reality, online audiences are already quite resilient and know what to do, right? If something is suspicious, check, uh, do you have friends in common with this person? Has this account been created five minutes ago? Is this really the picture of someone called Tiffany or is this stolen from Britney Spears album from a few years ago? There's a few tricks you can do. You can reverse search an image. Um, but I think all of this is things that people are already doing, checking you know, your sources. If you want to think about what can users do, there's one resource that I would highly recommend, which is um, First Draft, a fantastic uh, nonprofit organization that's focused on disinformation, has actually created an SMS-based disinformation course ahead of the election. You can just subscribe and sort of like once a day receive a little SMS that reminds you, hey, did you know you can verify this? Or did you know that that happened in a world of disinformation? It's really a fantastic resource. Um, finally, I will say, there's a lot of this that is not on the users. So for instance, everything has to do with major foreign influence campaign. It's not on the users to detect that. It's on the platforms to be organized. It's on the researchers to be focused. It's on the government to be proactive. We can't ask people to go about their day worrying that there is a foreign agent behind uh, all of their Facebook friends. That's neither desirable uh, nor realistic. I think that's the the most optimistic take I have heard all week. So so thank you for that. Um, I 
I would ask though, and David, um, I know that you all have been doing um, some work to create resources for individuals who are more domestically focused, I know particularly around voter suppression, which is sort of an auxiliary conversation, but related to the, the gauntlet of things that people have to run through to get to the, the ballot box. Um, how would, would you advise that, that people who want to get involved um, go about doing so? Sure, so, so three things. Uh, the first is there's lots of volunteer opportunities out there, especially for poll workers. There's a shortage of poll workers this year. We need poll workers. Uh, during the pan usually poll workers are older individuals. During the pandemic, they're often not able to fulfill that role. And so if you are someone who is, is healthy and, and able to be a poll worker, that's a great way for people to get involved. Uh, the second is uh, my organization, the Lawyers Committee, leads a, the, a coalition called Election Protection. Election Protection is the, the largest nonpartisan voter protection network in the United States. We have volunteers in all 50 states, uh, dozens of organizations, hundreds, possibly thousands of volunteers, uh, and we are still taking more volunteers. We operate a hotline, 866-OUR-VOTE, uh, where if you see problems at the polls, if you see voter suppression online, if you see uh, voter intimidation from militias or, or other sorts of hateful groups, please call us and report it. You can also go to our website, 866-OUR-VOTE.org, uh, there's reporting features online there as well, uh, but we can only respond to this stuff if people bring it to our attention. We have um, large legal teams that are ready to defend people's voting rights when we know that there's a problem. Uh, we have, I, I don't even know how many voting rights cases we have at the moment, but it, it's a lot. <laughs> um, and uh, you know we're we are very very worried in particular about voter intimidation efforts this year about um, militias and other uh, extremist groups attempting to interfere with people getting access to the polls if they're voting in person or attempting to interfere with vote by mail uh, and and so you know if if people are seeing evidence of these things please bring it to our attention. And then sort of the, the last thing, the third thing I'll say on this uh, with regard to false information that you see on social media, um, you know, we try to advise people to, to follow what's called an inoculation strategy, which is you want to spread good information. You don't want to spread bad information. So when you see bad information, sometimes there's this urge to, to repost it and say, look, this is bad. This is wrong but you're in the process, you're still spreading the bad information. And even if you are calling it out as wrong, it's sometimes worse to amplify it in that way than it is to just, than it is to, to not respond at all or to just share something that is purely true and factual and positive. So instead of saying, you know, look at what this guy said, this is total BS, instead say something completely separate that says like, here's the facts on how to vote or vote by mail or whatever. Here's where you can go to get resources. Here's the voter prote protection hotline, 866-OUR-VOTE. Um, you know, spread good information. Well, thank you both so much uh, for, for joining us with us today. Um, for those who did not catch that when it went through, uh, the, the website, uh, is www.firstdraftnews.org, uh, as well as 866rvote.org if you would like to um, report anything you're seeing. I also just wanted to flag that the Pacific Council is trying to be very active in the lead up to this election. Um, so please go to pacificcouncil.org. We have a whole host of resources. We can connect you with resources on how to become a poll worker if that is something you are interested and able to do. Um, as well as general information around issues that are particularly pertinent to the upcoming elections here in Southern California. We have a, an upcoming ballot measure party. 
all sorts of fun stuff. So I really encourage those of you who are members to come check it out. Uh, lastly, I will also note that this is a call that has been open to the general membership, or to, or sorry, to a general audience. For those who are members, there is a event tomorrow uh, with our CEO, Dr. Jerry Green, talking about the recent um, normalization of relations between Israel, the UAE, uh, and Bahrain. So if you'd like to join that, that's at 11 a.m. Um, if you'd like to join that and you're not a member, maybe look into becoming a member because it's a lot of fun. Um, but thank you again for joining us to our panelists. Thank you so, so much uh, for sharing your time and insights with us. And please make sure that uh, you all are registered and um, ready to vote. So have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>